We are being recorded for broadcast um, on Amherst Media so that um, when we get to public comment, public participation, we will be asking that people come and sit at the table um, in order to speak in the microphone because we want to make sure that the uh, Amherst Media program captures um, everything that is said today. Um, this meeting um, has several agenda items, but I want to be very um, clear because I know there's somebody here who's about one of the other items. I think that virtually the entire agenda today is going to be about the discussion of the uh, Valley CDC Community Preservation Act proposal uh, that was um, Consider, discussed briefly at our May 28 meeting and postponed until today for consideration so that it would be after last night's meeting. Um, we do have a couple of other things on the agenda um, and there's one item that I will have to bring up at the end for the committee under items not anticipated 48 hours in advance, which is really um, more of a committee organizational issue. Um, so I'm um, saying this because I don't think that we're going to have very much time for percent for arts. And um, if we do, it is really going to be to figure out when to talk about it, not anything else. So um, just wanted to let everybody know that who may be interested. Uh, Mr. Browdy. Um, I think you're welcome to a, you're welcome to stay. I just didn't want to mislead you because if we talk about it, I don't even think that we're going to get into the substantive discussion of what will be the agenda of topics to be discussed. I think it will be a more of a when we take it up question, and I can fill you in later if you would like. So just so you know. Um, so I need to make sure that we have a minute taker. Is Anthony, are you taking minutes? I have never taken five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. That was yes. Yes. You need to. Will Will you be able to? Or? I did last time. I still have to. Did we just get a volunteer? Yes. Yeah. That's why I was. Uh, I appreciate it if you did, but if you can't, uh, then we'll have to find somebody else to do it. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so, getting on to the um, major agenda item of today, um, I guess that uh, what is, yes. Um, we really are here principally to talk about the um, Community Preservation Act um, discussion and to, to follow up on that. And I'm looking for an email that I have on the subject um, that, here, just a second, here we go. So what had happened, uh, just to inform um, everybody present, that I sent a series of possible agenda items, or in a, by agenda I mean topic discussions under this um, item to members of the committee. And I'm going to tell you what they are right now uh, because the first thing that we want to do as a committee is to have a discussion and so that we can get clarification of what are the range of um, items that we want to discuss at today's for um, meeting for consideration. The things that I had put forward in that email, and I'm now reading the four items as I wrote it, the proposed borrowing, whether it will have an impact on our future borrowing capacity for major projects or affect the cost for those bonds. Number two that I recorded was, um, and Anthony, I can send this uh, email to you so that you have it. Um, 
what will be the annual repayment obligation which will reduce funds available for subsequent CPA processes, how many years and how much each year. Three is the effect on the operating budgets of town departments, in particular public safety, and four is any other town costs, such as capital costs. All of those matters are focused on uh, the budget and the financial considerations directly for the town. I have assumed that the Finance Committee discussion would be on that and not on the financials of the um, Valley CDC because that is really a Valley CDC uh, matter, but I am open for um, committee input on that. So uh, at this point, I would like to turn to my fellow committee members and ask if they have additional items or have comments on those items, and then we will proceed. Um, I agree the specific finances for the project are not uh, something we need to get into today, but I think to the extent there is any out year or other impact on public costs where the town might be involved, we those should be on the agenda for today, too. Can you give um, some example of what you're talking about? Uh, so for, okay, so, uh, and, I, and I actually, you know, I got some answers to this when I sent out. So an example would be if we need to have a bus stop and a carve out where the public works budget would have to come in because there isn't one currently there, so we needed to move one. If there isn't any impact, then not a problem. So that would be an additional public expenditure that might or might not be covered by the original developer costs that they're expecting getting. If long term, and I think I got good answers to this, but I thought we should get it on record that if uh, there are uh, capital expenditures for the project and if we originally invested in it, it would Valley CDC, if they didn't have enough reserves, need to come back to uh, CPA for uh, support for things like a major expense, roof and others, or are the reserves going to be at, you know, what happens longer term, so out five years, ten years. Okay. Um, some of that fits under number, as I wrote, number four, any other town costs such as capital costs. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to put it as a separate item, but just to, I appreciate right. the clarification. Just the clarification of what those would be. Yeah. Okay. Committee, anything else that, of major topics for that you consider financial considerations? Um, I'd like to just, I'm sorry, I'd like yes. to just start with these and let's see if something else emerges. Okay. Um, I, in a moment, I will um, recognize um, for an initial round of public comment, public comment solely on the issue of whether there are any other matters that members of the public should um, would recommend that we consider so that we have that on our list of topics for discussion. And uh, maybe I'll take a moment right now and see if anybody wants to um, add on that particular line. Mr. Hornick, yeah. Yeah, please come to the microphone now because we're trying to um, make sure that Amherst Media captures this meeting as fully as possible. Uh, do I need to press a button? I do in this case. Right? Yeah, it should, the green light should be on okay. and it should stay on when you, once you do that. John Hornick, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, I would like to speak to the role of the Finance Committee and the role of Town Council in reviewing uh, this particular proposal. Okay. Um, thank you. 
I actually was going to raise that as the next item for the committee as we go in, but uh, there's one other hand over here. And please identify yourself and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Kate. Uh, you need to press the button. Oh. Kate Sims, 77 Dana Street. Um, I would just like to suggest two additional topics for consideration. Um, one is, is there precedent for uh, subsidizing an outside development organization to the extent that is happening here? Um, I believe that their own numbers suggest that, uh, you know, the net cost of the town is at least $300,000, and yet they receive uh, $550,000 in developer fees and overhead and $16,000 in ongoing management fees. So the question is, you know, is there a precedent for that in the town? Um, and then my second question is just, did you get my detailed letter? Uh, George just mentioned that it was there and then moved and he couldn't find it. And there was a lot of uh, questions in there, particularly about the cost of the project. So I think the second question is just, you know, what is the cost of this project versus other possible alternatives to reach our goals? And I, I don't know if that's within your scope or not, but that's a question. Thank you. When, when did you send that email? I, I've just been deluged with emails, so I just want to make sure I could find it. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me let me respond on a couple of things. One is, um, the, and this is basically on the Community Preservation Act, because I think that it's important that um, everyone in the community, as well as the committee, obviously, I think already does understand the Community Preservation Act, and uh, Ms. Aldrich will supplement um, as um, needed, but the Community Preservation Act is actually a special increment of funding that was approved by um, the town, um, and uh, it actually was an election. It was not um, even a town meeting vote. It was, it's required by state law that it be through an election process. It adds um, an amount that, um, to, to taxation that has very limited but directed purposes, one of which is affordable housing, one another is conservation, um, historic preservation, um, are the major, in recreation or the areas. And um, the process that um, is required to take place then is that these are totally isolated funds, but um, there is a um, Community Preservation Act committee which is required to exist under state law. The process is that the Community Preservation Act committee sends out to nonprofit organizations and to others, including to within town, the town departments, um, requests for, essentially requests for proposals. Proposals are presented by a variety of um, different nonprofit um, providers as well as town departments. Those are reviewed through a thorough process that goes um, for, for several months during usually the winter or spring months and then at the end of that time, um, a, re a report is, and recommendations are made to the legislative body of the community, which is now the council. The council has the opportunity to vote. Um, yes, it will accept a recommendation. No, it will uh, not accept the recommendation or it can reduce the amount. It cannot increase the amount. It cannot change the terms and it cannot um, uh, add a new proposal. Um, so, uh, Sonia, have I missed anything in that summary? Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, the um, older finance committee before town meeting uh, used to, um, what they would do is they would review each of the proposals and um, their terminology was that they would say to town meeting, um, 
we uh, have reviewed this and find that it is consistent with the Community Preservation Act and is appropriate for funding. They did not make recommendations up or down on the proposal for the um, for the substantive content, but left that as a town meeting decision, but did make those comments. And uh, what we did with our other proposals, and I went back and uh, pulled up and have in front of me at the moment the um, finance committee's report to the council about the Community Preservation Act. And I'm going to read just two quick paragraphs from it because it will set the context of the discussion and then I want to get into the topics of discussion. What we wrote in the report was as follows. The Finance Committee reviewed the recommendations of the Community Preservation Act Committee beginning with a presentation by that committee chair and vice chair at a meeting attended by many members of the town council and therefore a meeting of the council. The committee considered whether each proposed project is sound, financially responsible, consistent with the purposes of the Community Preservation Act and raised any other legal questions. There may be other factors that the town council may consider to be compelling reasons to fund a project recommended by the Community Preservation Act Committee or not to not to do so. The committee voted to postpone the final consideration of the Valley Community Development Corporation proposal until June 25th after the forum announced by the president. We recommend the other proposals submitted by the Community Preservation Act Committee based on the criteria described above. And uh, so I am going to be assuming that the criteria that the committee is going to choose to consider the same criteria, uh, but um, that's obviously always subject to committee discussion. Um, so having said that, then I think that we can uh, get back to the question of the um, uh, agenda items that we wanted to talk about. And uh, the um, first one was the question of um, whether the proposed borrowing would have an impact on future borrowing capacity for major projects or other uh, or affect um, the cost for those bonds. And uh, Ms. Aldrich did um, respond to me on that. I don't know if you want to summarize your response as opposed to my reading. It. My response is that it would not be a significant um, hit to our borrowing capacity for all the large projects. Considering this is CPA funding, so it's coming from the surcharge, not from uh, regular taxation, and we're uh, about to drop two major debts from CPA this year. Our town hall masonry is dropping off, and for fiscal year 21, the Hawthorne property, which we bought, is dropping off. So we will see very little change. So, members of the committee. I, I just, I'm going to ask a couple questions to, just to make sure there's clarity for everybody, okay? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this money does fit under our borrowing ceiling. Is that correct? The capacity, yes, the limit. Thank you. Is there anything else? Um, this is in the realm of borrowing, and that is that we would borrow, if we approve this, this money would be available subject to the approval by the state of their funding, right? Correct. Okay, and in that case, therefore the money actually would not be borrowed maybe until late in this fiscal year, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Also, um, uh, Valley CDC would have to meet the town's requirements. 
So we have to go through the whole CBA. We don't, we don't just cut the check for 500000 It has to be a reimbursement. So they would have had to have started the project and started spending the money. OK. This is all very useful. I'm wanting to make sure people understand the pieces here. And then in addition to that, all of that would be subject to whatever happens at the ZBA. Yes. Okay. Finally, if CPA chose to recommend to us a year from now that they use half million dollars from next year's money to just pay off the loan, they could do that. That would depend on where we are in the borrowing process. If it was still uh, as a ban, which is a bond anticipation note, then we would have some of that flexibility. But once it's permanently borrowed as a bond, we don't have that flexibility. So. OK. All right. Thank you. Kathy. Um, so I was just going to follow up on Lynn's on when we would actually incur expenses for this. So you said it would be when the project is, as I understood it, uh, full-blown in that there, the state has approved the money and the town has approved the project. Yes. So it, it potentially is not even in the next fiscal year. It's a fiscal year. It's in two years, you know, depending on how. So it's actually when, when the actual plan for. We wouldn't borrow the money until we had to pay the money. Okay. So um, it could be next fiscal year. I mean, this fiscal year, or it could be down the road in 21. OK. Andy. Yeah, I'm Dorothy. Um, would this in any way impact um, how, our, how we would proceed in borrowing for the new school should we get the go ahead? I don't believe so. And I just want to be clear that the actual our expenditures start when we start paying debt service, not the 500000 I mean, just like a mortgage, you're building a house. You don't really incur the expense of that mortgage until the debt service is in place, which could be if they don't spend the money until 21, our first debt service will be in fiscal year 22. Just so you understand. Correct. So um, when we have, um, as a town, and of course these are based on t um, decisions made in town meetings in the past, have fairly often uh, borrowed money to fund larger CPA projects and then space them out. And the, the, you mentioned two that were some of the oldest ones because they're the ones that are about to be paid off. Uh, but the fact that they are about to be paid off, of course, uh, means that there will that the fund when we set up a CPA budget for the year, the first thing we do is subtract the amount that we know we have to use for repayment. Um, since those repayments won't be made if we borrow this money, then mm -hmm. it sort of, sort of washes against the other. Yes. Yes. Lynn. Um, Sonia, I know the legislature is still working on the budget, uh, but the issue of increasing legislative amounts for CPA is part of that discussion? Yes, it is. Has anything, to your knowledge, happened with that? I um, haven't seen anything come through from the coalition yet, so no. Yeah, I don't think they're done with the conference committee either. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for just so that everybody understands what that kind, what that question was about, is that um, communities that choose to participate in the Community Preservation Act by levying funds, that there is an additional um, piece of money that comes from the state. The state um, also levies um, a tax on transfer of property which goes into the statewide community preservation fund, and then it is given as grants to local communities. Um, and, but the amount uh, is uh, dependent upon legislative action. And uh, so the, we don't know the amount of 
that additional increment that we will receive from the state because the state budget has not been completed. Uh, so, anything else on the borrowing capacity uh, in proposed question before we get to the question two? Yeah, Lynn. I'd, I'd just like to push a little on the impact on future borrowing before we leave this. Um, we are queued up, hopefully, for up to four different capital projects in Amherst. Um, the one that's been most talked about is the schools. The first we will hear whether we're moving forward with that this year is December 12th, a date that will be in my mind for a long time. Uh, and if that is the case, we will have to come up in this next year or in this year with about Four hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars somewhere in there. It'll be the match to the feasibility study. But that feasibility study goes on for up to two years, and we wouldn't even move into full borrowing until we actually were approved to go ahead by the state. So that project could be as many as two, three years out in terms of big borrowing. Uh, the DPW and the fire station uh, are actually at the point where, as we identify and locate the land, we move to schematic design. In this year, the maximum that would be is about $250,000 per project. Uh, again, you can't build till you do schematic design, and then you have to go back out to bid. And so the earliest we would be in that phase would be in FY 21-22. Mm -hmm. um, the actual library project, I believe it's FY21 for the library, the statewide association. And so that one actually could come up at a little more money faster. But the later on in our agenda or sometime in a very future meeting, we're talking about those various projects. But I just wanted to point out to elaborating a little bit on Sonia's uh, statement, and that is by the time those projects hit, we'll be at least probably two years into payback on this project. So that gives some sense, I, I some think, sense of the rhythm. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that the major point, though, is that all of those projects have to be paid for by other funds. They are not paid for from the Community Preservation Act fund. I, I just want to clarify um, one thing on the MSBA and uh, borrowing for the schematic design. We would have to borrow the full amount of that, not just half of it, because the MSBA works as a reimbursement. So I don't want to surprise anybody down the road when we're asking for a million instead of 500000 or something like that. Um, but it does not count against our debt limit or our debt capacity, which we found, just found out recently that MSBA does not count against that so thank you yep okay so anything else okay, dorothy um, i'm um, having a problem putting two ideas together um, one we're discussing the finances and the question is is there anything uh financially wrong uh for the town to do this and that's the focus of what we're doing yet i kept hearing last night that um, this vote says the town totally approves of it, and um, we're just talking about borrowing and repayment schedules and not about the project itself. So I guess that means that this is just an advisory statement to the town council, and then at the town council, is that where the discussion will take place? Let me answer the first question. All committees are advisory to the town council. You want to go with the second? Um, if the council approves the borrowing, um, it will be an indication of support that will help the Valley CDC's submission to the state for um, the additional funding that it is seeking. 
and they are they do look for um, local support. There are other ways if the council were um, to want to um, indicate its support for the project but not authorizing the, the borrowing, that actually could come in some other fashion, I would believe, though I would have to um, look to some experts in the process to respond to that a little bit more fully. Uh, I think what they said was is that because of the fact that they look for local support, but we also have to remember that there was a point that was made, um, I think it was by Ms. Brestrup last night, that um, the, uh, there is a whole process of actually, if they file and ask for um, borrowing capacity, um, whether they, um, the town supports it. And that would come as a, um, to the council, and the council would have to vote on that anyway. So there, this, this question of support, um, um, is, it's not just totally tied to this. This is not the dispositive answer on that. Um, but I do think that the other thing that we probably all recognize is, is that um, as a nonprofit corporation, Valley CDC is trying to put together a package that would fund construction of a project that's a complex project. And, you know, their request for um, money is a real request for money to assist them with the package. And that if uh, the, uh, the council were not to um, approve uh, uh, of the proposal and uh, no CPA money is uh, given over that they would have to find alternative uh, funding for that additional piece and that may or may not um, be possible for them. I don't, um, it's not a discussion that I have had with Valley CDC uh, because I don't think that it's a question of a financial impact for the town, and which is what I think our responsibility is. Kathy. No, I just, um, when you look at the financing for the whole project um, in terms of our role, we're this $500,000 just leveraging another $4 million. So it's the actual building of the project is bringing in what I'm looking at, a large, a large amount of money, millions of dollars from the Housing Innovation Fund, a series of others. So this point about a package, um, that's, it's, if we were to try to build a project like this all by ourselves, we wouldn't be able to put a project like this together. So this is, I think, a high rate of return on this initial investment when we're looking at it. So to think that $500,000 would actually build this is, uh, it's a down, it's like uh, the front end cost on a mortgage that you have to put on on a house. Um, so I, I think in that context, it looms much larger than the amount of money we're looking at. So I agree, this is the impact on the town. And that's why I asked, are there any other long-term costs beyond the front end that we're putting in that we should anticipate, not saying that that's a killer deal for this, but just we should anticipate it, um, if there would be a future draw on CPA money beyond the repayment of debt. Okay, so uh, can we, yes, Linda. So what I'm hearing in what Dorothy's saying is something that I've been wrestling with as well, and that is, I believe there are things that we have heard during this conversation um, that spark, at least in my mind, some considerations that down the road might happen during the ZBA process that the um, Seat Valley CDC would take into consideration. And I guess the question I have, and maybe it's the one Dorothy has, is is there a point in time where it is appropriate 
for the council to express that even if it is not a condition of the vote, it's on the record. Yeah, uh, it probably is a council question more than a finance committee question. And I will see I, what I can get opinion on that before next Monday. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, maybe we I take these questions out of order since we're getting into the question of any other town costs, such as capital costs, which was the fourth item. Um, the, um, since uh, Ms. Brestrup is present, I, I ask the, I guess my question is this, um, if there were um, such costs, is it possible that the ZBA would consider um, that they put the responsibility for any such costs as a condition onto the granting of the approval so that the costs would have to be assumed by Valley CDC as opposed to by the town. Whether we have any other experience with uh, such conditions having been attached to proposals. I don't know what the, you know, you mentioned the 130 or whatever it was at Beacon. And uh, if there was, were there any similar analogous uh, provisions that you recall in that listing? Yes. Generally speaking, the Zoning Board of Appeals does not get into um, placing conditions on a project that involve um, the developer um, paying for items unless there's a direct um, connection between the item and the project. So for instance, if a project were to cause um, problems with an intersection close by because of traffic increases, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals could put a condition on the project saying, that the developer um, should participate, must participate in the improvements to the intersection. Um, so it would be something like that where there was a direct connection between uh, the impact and, um, and the project. I, I wanted to um, also, if you don't mind my going on for a, a minute longer. No, oh, please. Respond to Ms. Shane's concerns about um, Route 9 and the possibility of putting in a bus stop there. Um, I wanted to just remind everybody that uh, MassDOT is currently involved in uh, preparing a set of plans for improvements to Route 9 in the corridor from um, South Pleasant Street all the way down to University Drive. And those are currently in the stage of what they call 25%. So there are still opportunities to make adjustments to those plans and if um, it became clear that there was a need for a bus stop, I think a bus stop could probably be worked into those plans. And that section of Route 9 is owned by the state. So um, I'm not sure that the town would have a responsibility to construct anything in that corridor. Before you leave, Christy. Yeah. So one of the conditions, obviously, that went along with the Beacon Project was access from different directions for both people to walk as well as for emergency vehicles to get into the property. So I drove by recently and there was this, all of a sudden, a whole different sidewalk with being, or some level of concrete. It turns out it's a road for access for emergency vehicles and for pedestrians. I assume something like that was a condition of the project from the ZBA. Yes. So the ZBA did um, require um, Beacon to construct the sidewalk in the right of way along Coles Road, that was part of the project. Beacon um, committed to doing that without any kind of uh, cajoling on the part of the ZBA. It was part of the project that they designed and the ZBA agreed that that was necessary. Um, they didn't really make um, any in other improvements to Coles Road. For instance, the two ends of Coles Road were not 
improved as part of this project. They are providing a uh, pedestrian pathway across um, other private property from the project to Montague Road for pedestrians. Um, and they are providing a crosswalk across Coles Road to uh, the bus stop on the northern side of Coles Road. So there are some minor um, improvements in the right of way that they committed to. Yeah, there's one, while you're here, there's one other thing that came up last night, and there's, um, I might want to clarify too. Um, the whole beacon um, process was complicated. I'm speaking now as a former member of the select board, uh, because the select board also had to, um, chose to um, give a tax increment um, agreement with um, Beacon for um, the allowing the, uh, to helping with the financing. But um, in exchange, we um, achieved an agreement on deep affordability for um, some of the units and um, it was in, in perpetuity and it was embedded in the agreement that the select board approved for the tax increment financing. Um, in this circumstance, of course, we don't, we're not being asked about tax increment financing. That's not part of Valley CDC's request, but um, it's my understanding that um, the kinds of uh, agreements that were made through that um, process could also be placed by um, the um, ZBA and furthermore there was a question of whether uh, they could uh, Valley CDC could ever add more than more units to the number that were allowed to begin with and uh, Again, that's uh, something that would really be precluded by whatever the ZBA decision is, and I just wanted to clarify that for the community. Yes. Do you want me to respond? Yes, please. So um, the, com the Beacon Communities Project does have um, deep affordability. It does not offer units at 80% or less. All of the units are offered at either 50% or less or 30% or less, and that was part of the agreement that they made with the town, and they did receive um, over $2 million in tax increment financing over a period of 10 years. But the, um, in this circumstance, the ZBA would be able, if it wished, to consider similar requirements on this plan, yes? Um, they could consider similar requirements. It seems that um, Valley CDC is already offering a mix of units. Um, they're offering uh, units at 80% or less, they're offering units at 50% or less, and they're offering units at 30% or less. And the town could um, request a different mix if it chose to, if it had a reason to. Um, I think Valley CDC has given reasons why they think that particular mixture will work best in this situation and will give um, people in the kind of workforce um, strata of income um, a place to live as well as giving people with very low income a place to live. Does that Yes, help? thank you. Not wanting to keep looking back and forth because I want members of my committee to feel. Uh, so, um, Kathy, you had done some uh, research into the question that we're, t that we're now at, which is number four on the list, taking it out of order, any other town costs, such as capital costs. Uh, are you able to summarize for the other members of the committee what um, you found? Uh, yeah, and, and this is, I had some finance uh, directed questions and uh, at the urging of John Hornick and then the willingness of Laura to respond, I just sent them in and I expected quick verbal responses. Instead, I got very nicely 
thoughtful essays uh, coming back. Um, but I was looking at out years going out 10 or 20 years on the margins on the project and whether the question was both, uh, it's a thin margin, but if enough is being accumulated for things like the roof needs to be repaired, the boiler breaks down. So something that's not beyond mowing the lawn and maintenance. And she sent back, and we can post the responses. And it, it's actually, I was looking at an old, older budget. Um, so it was a revised budget. There's an initial amount put into reserves that's quite substantial, and each year there's more money being put into reserves. And it's a fairly substantial amount of maintenance costs in the budget on an annual basis uh, to keep up with the maintenance of the project. So I think we could post all of those, um, including a spreadsheet that does do a, a pro forma look out with a suppose Expenses go up 3% a year and only revenues only go up 2%. So it's almost a worst case scenario that you can't control it. And it's solid out. Um, it's not often that you see out 20 years on, on a look. Because my concern was that we would want to uh, maintain the units to be uh, the type of place people would want to live and not have deterioration and then worry about um, coming back, because for example, one of the loans that CPA is paying off is for renovation of Ann Whalen. You know, so looking at that, it's not just initially when you build it, but in the out years, and it looks to me like they have built in these costs. Uh, so I, I just might add that we also, I went over and took a tour of some of the uh, equivalent units. They're not quite the same because one was actually smaller than 240 square feet. Um, it was 200 and they're beautiful, you know, and so, and they've been around for uh, multiple years. So what you can see is a real pride in the building and the grounds, um, both of the people who are living there, but also the maintenance. So that was my concern that we, if we want good housing in Amherst, we should build it well at the beginning and then the, the project itself should have a built-in allowance for um, keeping it that way. Just a note that um, I received those from Kathy yesterday. I don't know if everything got loaded before last night's meeting, but at the top of the agenda for last night uh, at www.amherst.gov, 3489 Northampton Road Project should be all of these documents. And it, it would be, I mean, when you look at the the spreadsheet, what I call the pro forma, um, it was particularly instructive, I thought, because you can see how thin the margins are in out years, but it's in part because every year an amount is being put aside, um, and this includes the on-site uh, person who's managing it, but also the person who's coming in to help do services coordination. So those costs are built into the rents and the calculation of what it will cost to operate this um, in out years. So, members of the committee, yes, Lynn. Um, one of the things that has come up, and this actually does relate to town money, although it's federal dollars that come to us, and that is that uh, the issue of social services and the town, though we have a very small amount in our present budget for that, we do have a pot called CDBG, and we do provide that to social services around the town, uh, some of whom work with the homeless, and other people who don't have it. I'm not suggesting that that is a source of funds, but I just want to point out that there are other ways in which social services are also provided in the town to various populations by our money as well as a lot of state money that's available for that as well. Putting that web together, whether it's a single person or whether it's a variety of different people, that's not the purview of this committee. But it is an issue where a cost or an application could come to the town. Looking to the, anybody else who wanted take up anything right now on the issue that we're 
currently on, which is other town costs, such as capital costs. Uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to try and go through the, the other two items, have some discussion, um, presentation of initial information, and then I'm going to um, have a, a period of public comment so that um, anybody who has questions about topics that we've discussed um, has an opportunity to do so. Um, so I just wanted to assure you that I know you're there. And, uh, but um, as far, I, I, the, the second of the issues as we um, put on the list um, was what will be the annual repayment obligation which will reduce funds available for subsequent CPA processes, how many years and how much for each year. And Sonia sent a response which I sent to the committee and I'm going to um, try and explain it real quickly to you, give you the, the actual numbers. What this is about is, um, and this is always a concern, um, CPA is an important piece of funding because it enables us as a community to invest in public housing, recreation, um, conservation, uh, in historic preservation. And um, money we spend from that pot of money on one topic uh, um, or item is then not available, obviously, for others. That's what budgeting is all about. And um, so that um, if we set aside an amount of money of this amount by borrowing, then for that number of years that it requires to pay back, that money is not available for other grant purposes for CPA in future years. Uh, and so that is a direct financial consequence because it's affecting the CPA budget in future years. Um, as has been noted, this has been done um, Previously, it is a part of the state statute that allows this to be done. Uh, we have some of the big projects that are about to be paid off, uh, but I want to, uh, the amounts, it depends upon whether it's done as a 10-year or five-year bond. And uh, if it is done as a 10-year bond at a 4% interest rate, um, in, in the first year, and this is typical, by the way, of bonds that they, the amount that um, is paid, required for repayment declines over time. In the first year on the 10-year bond, the repayment total would be $70,000. In the last year, it would be $52,000. Uh, and of course, it would uh, be declining over that 10-year period. Uh, if it was done as a five-year bond, uh, the first year would be $120,000 and the last year would be $104,000. Uh, the total amount uh, that would be repaid is going to be lower on the quicker payback because the interest is less. Uh, but um, it has a greater impact during those years that of payback, if it's done as a shorter bond, um, has a greater impact on other CPA projects during that period of time. So the five and 10 year um, question makes a difference. I did send those numbers to um, the Finance Committee. It has not been shared with other members of the council, uh, at least not yet. We'll make sure it's posted. But it will be. Uh, so, um, I didn't know if, the, if there were any questions from the council about that particular topic, um, since it was a fairly straightforward question that came back with a fairly straightforward answer. Okay. So, um, then the last question that we said was, um, that we had identified was the effect on operating budgets of town departments, in particular public safety. Uh, 
And uh, we did hear a little bit from the police chief on this issue last night. Um, we did, um, I did send a um, memo to the town manager who's on vacation this week. So he's, Mr. Zomack is here in his stead. Um, uh, he did not respond that he, to the question, do you foresee any uh, significant uh, expenses that we would need to consider? Um, I don't know if you're aware of anything that I'm afraid I don't have any additional information on that. I'm, I, I do know that Mr. Bockelman has, has spoken to both chiefs about the, about the proposed development, um, uh, but I don't have any detail on those conversations. Okay. Shall we? Um, so I had mentioned yesterday about the research paper that looks at what are the savings uh, and costs, what are the costs of uh, housing and providing housing to homeless people, and then what are the savings um, with respect to emergency and other costs associated with people living um, uh, without homes, and that was $6,000. And then there's additional information on websites like the Massachusetts Housing and Shelter Alliance which document the savings per year as 27,000 for Massachusetts, and the cost of housing per person is 15,000, so there's net savings of 12,000 to um, when we actually provide housing. So we should definitely look into, you know, what are the savings when we take care of people. The other thing I wanted to highlight was the cost of postponing the construction. So you know, there's a suggestion we need more time to think about it and so forth. And I'm in no way saying this is the only thing we're gonna do in our town. We definitely need to look at how to improve the system. This is not Valley CDC not doing a good job. This is a broken system overall that makes it so difficult and expensive for um, developers like Valley CDC to provide this kind of housing. And I, I would be very interested personally and commit to looking into that issue in the long run. But for now, I think we are very lucky to have uh, someone like Valley CDC, and many of us have gone and looked at their projects in Northampton, and they are so well maintained, and they are so thorough with, with you know, they have a really good reputation. And so um, I would really like us to consider the cost of postponing and make, you know, keep that in our consideration. The last thing, which is personal to me, but I'm just gonna put it out there, is what is the cost of human life? We lost three people in a year and a half, and I don't know how we put a number to, to that. I, I really don't know where this issue fits, but it's the issue of the property and the taxes it will pay. Could we have any information on that? Call somebody. I'll call a friend. You'll call a friend. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we do have uh, something that was placed in one of the answers that Valley CDC gave that they had obtained that information from uh, the town assessor, who is, I think, uh, Sonia is contacting to see if there's an answer to that question that we can get directly from the assessor. Right, and I'm looking back both at the information Kate Sims had and the response from Valley CDC. Unfortunately, I haven't read it word for word, so I'm still confused. So, the so, bottom line is the property does pay taxes, and that's that's a given. And in the 20, if we do the 20, put up the spreadsheets, um, they're showing the amount per year. So over a 20 year period, it's a, a little over $600,000. So it's in the 21,000 plus per year is what's, what's in the um, spreadsheet now. And, and actually it was looking at the, having purchased the property, they're paying taxes now on it. Yes. Laura, That's Laura's here so she can Laura's raised be more specific. Yeah. Uh, and for the, uh, please identify yourself just because we're going out on Amherst Media and some people may not have been there last night. Who have forgotten me from last night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Baker, I work for the Valley CDC. Um, oh, 
There are um, an analysis done in the myriad materials that are there that compares the tax revenue that would be received were the property to continue at its present use. It pays about $5,400 a year in taxes now uh, compared with the re redeveloped use. And I did talk with David Burgess. We together looked at what we thought the value would be, which is what's going to determine the future taxes. So what would be the likely value of the property after development? And from that, we looked at the current tax rate and, and put a number on it of $21,000 um, at today's tax rate. So when we went out 10 years, I think the difference, the added revenue over the current use and the proposed use was around 178000 And then over 20 years, I think it was around 400000 But those spreadsheets are available. We trended them both at 3%. So what we really looked at was what's the incremental increase in tax revenue, because obviously it's going to be a more developed site. Um, it's going to be a more valuable site. And so it will, it will generate more tax revenue. Um, unlike the public housing authority, which is typically tax exempt, unlike, I think, the college field that we're next to, which I believe is also tax exempt, um, this would be a, a taxable property paying mm -hmm. at the rate that the assessors value it at. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Don't go away, Laura. While, while Laura is still there. <laughs> okay. So um, we've been looking at, and Kathy's done detailed analysis of your budget and uh, margins, and yet the questions I've asked you about the budget, you have not answered. And I honestly thought from the email you sent me and a document you said to read about a possible service plan that I was not to disseminate, which I have not, I thought there was going to be a great surprise last night in which you were going to give some more details and which in cost relates to your budget of uh, service coordinator and more follow-up service on the clients. Because as Shalini said, this is very important. But our, our interest in doing this is really not just in housing people in cold weather, but it's, it's to do, as one of the clients said last night, to provide an opportunity for development and growth and, and true independence. And um, I just don't know why you can't give us those details that you suggested that you were thinking about and working about, because this process is outlined last night. It's going to go on forever. And some of us have jobs and you know, don't want to be at every meeting, every hearing, uh, writing letters, constantly posting. There are other things that we have to do as people and as town councilors and as just citizens of the town. Yeah. So I'm just wondering why the delay? Yeah, uh, Dorothy, um, before you answer, um, I'm going to turn this over to the council president. This is uh, where we're going beyond the finance committee considerations of financial issues that are pertaining to the town, which is what we said that the uh, purpose in the Finance Committee uh, recommendations would be solely focused on that. Um, so I don't, uh, wanted to turn to the Council President, who's also a member of this committee. So, uh, Dorothy, I, I hear you loud and clear, and these are the questions on many people's minds. Um, and I'm certainly going to look to Laura to add to this, but I'm going to put on a long-term knowledge of social services that come from my own life, okay? No one individual can be served by one other individual. If you are homeless, you have somebody working with you about housing, you have somebody helping you get food, you have somebody helping you get health, and you have somebody helping you get transportation. And all of those very often, and unfortunately, are not the same services. But what we're really looking at is there's somebody that's going to help make sure the person gets that service. And that service is coordinated. So my 10 years with the Amherst Survival Center, where we bring in all of those different services to meet with the over 50 people who are homeless that we serve. They, you know, they get that, but they don't get it from the same person. So one of the reasons why, and this really is beyond the finance committee, but one of the reasons why earlier 
I was talking about CDBG money, but yet not being specific about it paying for a single person is because for better or for worse, that's not how services are provided in our society. And I'm assuming that the eight homeless people who would be fortunate enough to land in this home, in this apartment complex, this studio apartment complex, would already be coming with a cadre of services that have been helping them get to that point. And there is nothing more rewarding than seeing someone who's gone through that and now has a job and they can even move out. But it didn't get there by one person. It got there by a village. But turning back to the finance issues, which I, as I'm going to go back, we actually do have, um, I, I think, a fifth question that came up, and I think it's a valid question. And I'm going to just say, kind of respond to it a little bit myself for, with an analogy, and then see if you have anything you want to add. But um, it was labeled as cost of postponement, um, that if um, the thought was uh, has been made by suggestions of several citizens that we not vote on this proposal now but put it off so that we have more time to work on um, refining the proposal, um, that there's actually a cost of postponement. And um, I've had this experience in a very unfortunate way in my um, select board role um, that uh, we had a $67 million school proposal and uh, at town meeting, when town meeting was considering whether to authorize the bonds, I uh, made a, uh, what I thought was a forceful statement to town meeting um, as a financial person on the select board estimating $13 million as a minimum additional cost if we postpone the project. And lo and behold, um, I was unfortunately correct because the number now is $80 million. So my $13 million projection was actually real. So I kind of feel like it's actually a valid issue. And I don't know if you have any comments from um, the, as to what the consequence of postponement would be. Am I still on? I am still on. Yes. So we've been seeing uh, pretty radical uh, cost inflation in construction. It's been particularly bad this year because of trade and tariff and things like that. So, you know, we look at 5 to 8 percent a year uh, inflation for construction costs. So that's a significant number when you're looking at our construction budget alone. Um, because we kind of went out on a limb and bought this property um, in response to the really competitive nature of the Amherst housing market. Um, we also have carrying costs associated with the property. Um, and so we're probably looking 50 or 60,000 a year, just, you know, debt service, taxes, maintenance, lawn care, I mean, all the usual things that go on. Um, and so that's an issue for the project as well. So there's just normal escalation that would happen with any capital project um, that we would experience. And affordable housing is very challenging to finance, um, to put all the different sources together. And so every time the source size side goes up, and typically the state does not increase its caps year to year in spite of the escalating construction cost costs, so the squeeze um, gets worse year to year. So yeah, we see that as a real a real concern. Thank you. Uh, and just for um, added information for the committee, uh, you mentioned percentage increases in construction costs over time as being a factor in a calculation of this nature. When I did that calculation before the town meeting um, presentation that I referred to, I'd used a 7% figure, which is within the range that you talked about. I just had to pick a number. Um, so are there any other council, or uh, committee um, 
questions about anything that we've now talked about, including the fifth issue which we've identified. Sonia went out to get information. Unfortunately, David's not here. And so. I think we actually we did get some information from Laura when you were, um, because she had had conversations with David and gave us the details of those conversations, which actually I think um, were before us in other information that is on the website. It's in some of the documentation. So, um, Anything else from the committee right now? And if not, I'm going to see if there's uh, public questions or comments. Uh, but I want to give, yes, Shalini. I just want to share one thing that, um, that came up for me yesterday at the meeting. And um, it's been a huge learning process for me, uh, meeting with the residents and Valley CDC people and just reading up about it. and. Just as an example, I th I mean, what blew me away is the interconnectedness of all of this. We're looking at it in bits and pieces, all these different pieces of information. But just to see the interconnectedness of all the players and people and how it's impacting so many more people than we know. Just as an example, the we everything is recorded here by uh, MS Media, which is uh, provided free, I, I believe, to the town people. It's such an important resource for us. So they are able to do their job with interns who are not paid for it, but they get, you know, they get experience. Those interns are not paid, and they're putting in time for all of us, and those interns are the kind of people who would be living in an apartment like this. Like the gentleman yesterday who was recording us till 11 at night, he was there. He doesn't get paid for it, but he would probably be one of the people who would live in be able to live in Amherst in a town, in an apartment like this. So that's just seeing how all of these pieces are connected, how, you know, as Pamela said yesterday, it takes a village to build a healthy community. I think we really should keep that, I really invite all of us to keep that in mind. Thank you. So, uh, appreciate comments. Anything else from the committee? If not, um, is anybody from the public who would um, like to be recognized at this point? Um, so we'll start with, again, stay with the same order, Mr. Hornick first, and then go. Sims. Ms. Sims, and then see what, uh, if there are others. How's that? John Hornick again, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and my comments really do come from the trust, not just from myself. I want to discuss briefly the role of this committee in the larger town council. Last night, we heard a number of people who opposed this project and believe the town council should examine every aspect of it before deciding upon the CPA recommendation. As you all undoubtedly know, there are at least two very important groups that are charged with the responsibility for re review of this and other affordable housing projects, the Town Zoning Board of Appeal and the Commonwealth's Department of Housing and Community Development. For those of us who stayed into the fourth hour last night, uh, we learned that both of these groups routinely examine this type of proposal with a fine tooth comb. If I recall correctly, Christine Brestrup, the town planning director, said the ZBA had attached 150 conditions uh, to their approval of the North Square development by Beacon Communities. Peter Jessup, for many years a local developer, spoke about being put through the ringer by ZBA for building project after building project that he proposed. Tom Gagelman, the Chief Executive Officer of Home City Housing, a not-for-profit housing developer based in Springfield, uh, told us that DHCD looks, uh, requires an extensive application and looks in, at the, in detail at the budget and financing plans for each project it reviews as well as the management plan before deciding whether to approve a proposal. And they are not all approved, especially on initial application. It is my understanding that if a developer, and this was confirmed earlier, fails to receive either a permit from ZBA or funding from DHCD, 
the promised $500,000 permit uh, from CP CPA is canceled. The town is no longer obligated to pay. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you cannot choose to do this level of review instead of entrusting it to others who are responsible for it. It is up to you, after all, to decide what specific tasks you wish to take on. But I do suggest uh, that having this finance committee or the larger town council take on these detailed reviews is probably not sustainable. Because I am before the town finance committee, I will turn my attention to the matter before you, the CPAC recommendation. Looking at the criteria by which CPA applications should be judged, I believe, one, that this is an appropriate use of CPA funds under the category of community housing, one of the four categories permitted. Amherst has been using CPA funds to support a wide range of local housing projects over the past decade. This fits. There is a community need for this type of housing. There is documented need for housing to serve low-income individuals in the 2013 Housing Production Plan, as well as other documents. New affordable housing production, both past and planned, has largely targeted the needs of families. The proposed amount is well within the resources available to CPAC, as Ms. Aldrich pointed out, and CPAC has not exceeded its fiscal authority in making this recommendation. They have used this bonding authority in the past, there's nothing new, and they have a dedicated annual revenue stream from state and town funds to pay off these loans. And to this I will add a fourth point. CPA funding is expected to leverage state funds, particularly from the Department of Housing and Community Development, in amounts that far exceed the town's commitment. DHCD just released a special notice of funding availability for small projects like this that is proposed here, like the one that is proposed here. This does not occur on a predictable schedule, and the timeline for responding is short. Therefore, it is essential that the project be shovel ready when opportunity knocks. I urge you to advise the full council to approve this recommendation without delay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And I, uh, I appreciate the comments, and I do uh, remind you that we will, in, to the extent that some of the topics went a little bit beyond finance. Uh, to, uh, I hope you were, uh, there's an opportunity to share them in other places, but we are going to um, limit our recommendations on what we determine to be purely financial matters. Um, Ms. Sims, uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so this is a very expensive project for the town, and Shalini just mentioned the need for good information to be out there, which I completely agree with. Um, at this point, neighbors have made a series of arguments um, and tried to highlight the, the key role of information. Um, I don't have any problem if you, the council, or voters in general do not find those arguments compelling. But to be honest, I think what, what neighbors have a really hard time with is that it feels like a lot of the information uh, isn't seeing the light of day, while a lot of the information that Valley CDC has carefully prepared is listed front and center on the town's website. My ask is that the materials carefully prepared by neighbors um, to Valley CDC's information, um, including the detailed letter that I prepared responding to Valley CDC's May 21st letter to the Finance Committee, be posted with equal clarity and status on the website. So currently, Valley CDC's information appears as separate, easily clickable documents. Everything that Neighbors has sent, um, which right now I think only includes until last Friday or something, is buried in a, a gigantic PDF document. Um, that makes it very hard for the public to actually see that information. Um, so my, my question, and the document that I prepared contains detailed links to lots of other uh, town documents that will be completely lost if it's posted as a PDF. It, it, if it's posted as a word, those links come through, people can really see that other information. Um, so my, my main question is, you know, when could we expect that these would be posted by? Whose responsibility is it to post these documents? Um, and 
uh, you know, I, again, I, I think there's some key information in there. So for instance, we just talked about tax revenue and what the town invests. The town is investing $750,000. The net change in tax revenue is $418,000. Those numbers, when subtracted, show that the town is putting in more than $300,000. That's an important piece of information, whether or not it's compelling or not. Um, it does suggest what the town is putting into this. Um, finally, I guess I would just, so I would just say that, um, that there's also a human cost to wasteful spending. Uh, more people can be helped if we do things in a cost-effective fashion. And I don't quite understand why Valley CDC hasn't rented this house out so that people can live there while this project is being developed. Um, and I don't quite understand why we're not interested in, in seeking a more cost-effective proposal overall. But again, the, the main problem I think that neighbors have at this point is with process. We've really just been asking for a reboot of this process so that neighbors are involved in the planning process from the start instead of it feeling as if uh, you know a lot of things are happening that uh, neighborhood didn't get to weigh in on. Um, so could I just ask for the questions to be answered about when could those documents be posted by? Can all of the PowerPoint presentations and that letter be put as separate clickable documents on the town website? And whose responsibility is that? And when might that happen by? Thank you very much. Do you want to respond? Yes, I'm more than glad to respond. We began working on making sure all of those documents were pulled um, at the time and they were caught up as of Friday, okay? So I will go back with the people in town who are employees of the town uh, who are working on that and to, those, to the extent that we can pull out individual documents that have links in them such as yours um, as I received additional documents yesterday, I must have forwarded 20 emails and said, please put these on the website. Uh, it's trying to make sure we're as up to date as possible. Um, but it is town employees, but I have been working closely with those town employees and asking that it be done and they have been working on it very hard. Okay. When should we check back by, I guess is the question. I I will check in this morning after the meeting's done early this afternoon and see where we stand on that. The, the PowerPoints from last night that were presented by neighbors were not provided into last evening, which I understood was going to be the case and is acceptable. Um, those now, we will post them on that web page. Whether we also post them as documents that were part of the meeting, I will check on that as well. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Yes, okay. go ahead. Um, I, can I ask a clarifying question? So what I'm hearing you say is that there are a lot of questions being posed by residents and information shared. I get one part of it, which is the information shared and it needs to be posted so that everyone can see I get that. But what I also heard you say is that you're asking all these questions and you're not get, receiving responses to, am I right in that or no? No, I, I actually feel like Laura's done a very nice okay. job in, in okay. answering questions. I think uh, the concern is that the town website currently contains material prepared by an outside organization that is posted by the town in an easily accessible fashion and it does right. not do the same for the neighbors and abutters. All of that information is okay. buried into a huge document. And, and let me okay. just say one of the things that actually took place during uh, the initial exchange with residents is some residents were not aware that the moment they wrote town council, that document was public. We've now included on our website as well as the town manager's website that all documents sent to us are in fact public. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to live a private life, don't be a town councilor. Uh, so um, the, it, so we're, we're working on that as well and helping people understand that. I've actually seen your document and you've had a very rich and full exchange with Laura. I think your questions have been excellent and I think Laura and her staff have provided good responses. It's worth making sure it's posted. Thank you. Okay. Committee of other, let me just say there are other members of the public I now see. Um, 
Stratteridge. Good morning. My name is Tim Adderidge. I live at 143 Northampton Road. And I, I come to the podium to ask for a little bit of clarification and to make a statement. Uh, the clarification is that the CPA um, was adopted by the town meeting, I believe, back in 1999 or 2000. And the purpose of that was to allow taxpayer funds to be used on specific items, uh, low-income housing being one of them. Uh, it, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was 1.5%. And then around 2005, 2006, it was raised to 3%. Still, the same purpose was to spend taxpayer money on specific items. And when I see that the CPA has recommended $500,000 for the development of the VCDC property at 132 Northampton Road and asking the town to borrow $500,000, it says to me that the CPA funds are not sufficient in what they have in escrow to fund this project. So they want the town of Amherst to borrow $500,000 to help them do that. Well, I believe that it was the town voters that said, we are accepting this so that the tax monies that are raised can only be used. And if we allow the select board, I mean the Town Council or the Finance Committee to okay this, it allows the VCDC to have, or any um, entity that is using CPAC funds, to have two bites at the apple. In other words, the town meeting members said that we want this, these funds available to do certain things. But the VCDC are the housing advocates, uh, the low-income housing advocates in the town say, we want to do this now. So therefore, we are going to use taxpayer money that is not from the VCDC, or pardon me, not from the uh, C, uh, CPAC. And I have a, uh, a real strong objection to that because it's just a way of doing something with the CPAC funds when they don't have the appropriate amount of funds to do what they want to do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call Mr. Delaney in a second uh, um, to respond to this a little bit too, but um, it's what I was explaining before is that when we borrow money that is uh, for CPA purposes, the repayment is from the Community Preservation Act funds, so no other town funds are being used to support the borrowing, and it is a determination that the project fits within the purposes of the CPA and uh, is being repaid from CPA because it allows us to do that. Now, the first time that I recall us doing that is this town, and as I pointed out, it was in the state statute, was with the Plum Brook Athletic Fields uh, mm -hmm. down on Potwine Lane. And we could not have afforded to do that work uh, without uh, borrowing the funds that were required to be borrowed. But the repayment was entirely from uh, the Com Community Preservation Act budget. Um, and I uh, asked Anthony or Sonia uh, whether there are um, circumstances where there have been CPA proposals that were not town projects. That was a town project, of course. That were not town projects that involved borrowing before. Yes. 
done a lot for conservation land purchases. Rolling Green. Yep. Rolling Green. Yep. There. Well, let me ask this question then. Um, the CPAC, I understand the CPAC is going to uh, repay the loan or pay back the loan. And this is just more or less an advance on what they're going to pay back in the future. However, does that cover all the cost incurred through the debt of the borrowing? In other words, CPAC will pay back instead of the 500000 whatever interest on top of that loan is. And yes. The answer is yeah. yes, and we can post the statistics that uh, uh, Andy cited, but in that, whether it's a five-year or a 10-year, right. was how much interest each year, so the total cost, and it's all drawing on the CPA funds. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you have anything else. Nothing to add. I think you covered it. Okay. So, uh, uh, CPA is a very complicated state level. And when you that. buy in, you buy into all the stuff mm -hmm. that comes from the state. So that's just to be kept in mind. When the town decided to do that, we said we're willing to abide by whatever the state says CPA does. Yeah. Um, the example that was given for just for the, this actually for the committee's benefit too is that uh, when we when I was asking the question of a reminder of when we have borrowed funds um, from CPA that were not for a town purpose like Plumbrook or the repair of town hall, and the answer, of course, Dave uh, and Sonia reminded me is Rolling Green when we. Uh, assisted with uh, preserving affordability for Rolling Green um, apartments because it was going to be sold uh, to a private developer that would have taken it out of subsidized um, how unit requirements that had been imposed at the time that it was built. It was, it was called expiring use. And uh, the arrangement that was made was that um, the town would assist in the purchase of it, and uh, so, but it was Beacon that was, uh, which is the same organization that is doing the North Square that we worked with in North Square. So there is precedent. Okay. That's useful. That's useful. Yes, you know, no. Tim. Um, the analogy that I was making is is that you have a, a set number of funds to use on certain items. And you wanna, for example, you wanna buy a, a new car. Your, your car's getting worn out, you need a new one. You don't have the funds to do it. So you borrow, you borrow, that, you borrow those funds and somehow find a way to repay them back. I don't see how CPA funds can be stored up and, and borrowed against for future, for, for immediate projects and pay it back in the future. I thought that CPA funds were to be used on those items and if you don't have them, you wait until that money builds up. No, that's not what the state statute says. The state, state law is very clear that um, the kind of borrowing that is being requested is a standard part of the Community Preservation Act choices that a community has <laughs> that it can borrow money and pay it back from future CPA funds. Um, it does have a consequence. I did identify that at the, earlier on when I was um, giving the, the, the payback amounts because it has a real consequence, a financial consequence and one that I, um, think that the committee needs to uh, both consider itself in making its recommendation and will uh, point out in its report to the council. I view the report to the council as both informative about our discussion as well as our recommendation. Um, it will, um, any money that is being paid back during the time of payback is then not available during those future years so that um, when the future CPA committees are making decisions, they will be 
making decisions on a slightly lower amount of money uh, for the proposals that are coming in in each of those subsequent years if the um, because the first chunk of money would then have to be used for repayment. Uh, and that's about all I can say on it. Well, thank uh, you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, I guess that, that's all okay. I have to say. Thank you very yeah. much. Ms. Baker, did you have anything you wanted to add? Please. Hi, just a few financial items that I've heard people talk about that I wanted to quickly respond to. Um, regarding the fees that Valley will earn as part of this project, you'll see them broken into overhead and developer's fee. The developer's fee is about half of the earnings and it's at risk money. So it doesn't get paid till the very end of the project. Um, if we have cost overruns in the project, which is very possible, um, that fee would get used to pay those. Um, the state uh, reviews all of the budgets for these projects. They have standards that they look for. They also have a cap on the fees that developers can earn, and we are below that cap that they set. Um, the management fee that's earned during the course of operations is an actual cost of the project. We have to pay people to manage it. Uh, it is not retained by Valley CDC. It's paid to HMR to do their job to manage the property. Uh, typically, the cash flow, if there is any, uh, when, you, when you get the income and you pay the expenses and there's a little bit of money at the end, typically it stays with the project because it's not enough to suck off and we want it there as a, as a cushion. Um, uh, the comment about renting the house is something that we are definitely looking into. The house has condition issues, including lead paint, um, that we need to consider uh, as a landlord. Uh, it, we also, if we're using uh, public money, contemplating public money in the future, and we have a tenant that we place in that house, we owe relocation, potentially relocation benefits to that tenant. So it's a little bit of a complicated math problem about um, whether it's worth uh, renting it, given all those other costs that we would incur to rent it. But it's definitely something that we, will, uh, we are looking at. Um, I was struck last night when the, the police chief said that 12% of their calls are related to homeless persons. And uh, looking at their approximately $5.2 million budget and thinking about what that means in financial terms for the police department to be responding to that number of calls, it seems to me you wouldn't have to do much to decrease that one or two percent to have a big impact on public safety costs for the town. I was very surprised uh, when he gave that number last night. Uh, thank you. Okay, this is the number we're gonna yeah, come, please come to the microphone, though. I'm sorry, just, just super quick. I just, just want to point out that um, there is also a 10% contingency for soft costs and a 10% contingency for hard costs in their budget. And I'm confused about the management fee that she just mentioned because there are separate line items in their budget for uh, staffing and for all of the property maintenance. So, and it certainly looks like the 7% management fee uh, is is overhead, so I'm I'm just genuinely confused about that. Thank you. Yeah. We do, um, as is typical, carry contingencies for construction and for soft costs, especially early in planning, because our numbers are not well defined. We have to go out and really reality test them. In an escalating cost situation, um, such as we talked about before. It is not at all uncommon to go through those contingencies and then some, and that's where the developer fee would kind of backstop um, those assumptions. Um, the management fee, 7%, is paid to the property manager. It is their staffing cost. So it's distinct from maintenance, someone who might be fixing a screen or mowing the grass. It's, um, we do a lot of uh, compliance work. We have to document people's incomes. We have a lot of fair housing requirements. We have agencies come out several times a year to view the property. Uh, we have paperwork associated with the uh, project vouchers that we're using. So there's a whole set of tasks specific to managing the kind of paperwork and tenant side of the property, and that's what that 7% management fee uh, goes for. There's an asset management fee of $1,500 a year that if we're able to earn it, would uh, come to Valley CDC uh, and for the job of general oversight of 
all the vendors for the property, as well as um, oversight of the asset itself. So we do the capital planning, um, looking at long-term capital replacement year, uh, needs for the, for the project. It's definitely not a winner for us. Um, we put much more time in than $1,500 a year in terms of oversight for the properties. Just to follow, I assume some of those marks are part of what's required by the state in terms of contingency fees, et cetera? They, they absolutely will be nervous if we don't come in in certain levels of contingency. It right. will be a problem for us. Yeah. So with, yeah. with construction, if you don't have, you know, typically you want 10%. If you don't have at least 5%, your funders will get very skittish. Right. I've, having overseen and raised money for one construction project and overseen two, you've got to have your contingency fees, et cetera. Especially working on a rehab of a, an existing property because you run into things that you didn't know uh, during the course of construction. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move this along if I can, unless there's any other public comments. Uh, um, the committee needs to decide whether it is ready to make a recommendation. And uh, I want to again uh, go back to the question that I started very early on. What we said for all other Community Preservation Act proposals that were presented to us earlier um, in the, this year's process, the statement we made to the town council was that the committee considered whether each proposed project is sound, financially responsible, consistent with the purposes of the Community Preservation Act, and raised any other legal questions. And we also recognize that there may be other factors that the town council may consider is compelling reasons to either um, fund or not fund a particular project, but our recommendation was based on that first sentence. Are there other considerations that um, this committee would like to add, or are we making a recommendation based upon the same criteria as for the other proposals? Committee. I, I think it's the same, but as you, we listed at the very beginning, um, we're doing both current and longer term, so I think we have addressed those. So it's not just at this moment. You know, a few of the other proposals were clearly just a cash outlay for right now. Um, so yes, I think that's a good statement. So what I would propose, to, um, subject to um, a motion from the committee, is that, um, if the committee makes it wishes to recommend that that be the motion, the basis of the motion to recommend, and that the report to the council um, summarize the five issues that we have now discussed and the information that we developed and what we heard from the community, so that um, our um, the information that we've gained is shared with the full council in a similar fashion to what we've done with other finance committee reports. Um, so that would be my recommendation. And um, I will, as I have in the past, if that is what the agreement of the committee is, is work with Kathy as vice chair to produce that report on behalf of the committee. Um, so if there's committee agreement to that general process, um, then what we would need is a um, motion, um, and I'm not gonna offer it, but it would be a motion to um, recommend the project based upon um, the criteria of consideration from used from the prior report and recommendations. So if there's a motion, I will take it. Yes. Got it down there. Yes. That's the motion. OK. <laughs> so the motion has been made uh, by Shalini. And is there a second? Second is by Lynn. Um, we've been discussing the motion for quite a while, so I don't know if we need further discussion. Is there any? If, if 
Just a quick comment. Uh, if you see me run from the room, it's because I have a class. Okay. Because uh, I do have one thing that I will do try to do real quickly afterwards, uh, and then we'll have to schedule the next meeting. Um, uh, but I think we can go ahead and vote. Um, all in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye and raising hands. Aye. Aye. So it's a unanimous 5-0 vote. Um, I had the, the item that was um, postponed for discussion um, I met with the, um, I'm trying to see if I can find my notes on it right now. Um, I, I'm, I met with the OCA regarding the um, resident members of the committee. And um, the OCA uh, yesterday, and there's some, um, some members of OCA present if they wish to participate, they're certainly welcome to, but um, OCA postponed. Um, action on um, in discussion of the um, initial um, recommendations and um, for a future meeting. But one of the things that came up during the conversation was is that um, there were a number of people, and I don't have an exact number, um, but they would have been people who would have been given active consideration in their process but that um, when they found that we have our meetings during the day, they had to withdraw because it conflicted with their own personal schedules. And um, so it raised a series of questions. One is it put us on notice that um, we were being, uh, that, that our time of day for the meetings was affecting what um, the, uh, ability of some people who might otherwise have been interested in doing that, uh, uh, participating as resident members of this committee. And uh, so one question was whether we would, with that information, revisit the issue. The second issue was uh, uh, just generally whether we uh, still feel that it's appropriate to have uh, resident members of the committee. It, any change in that would, of course, have to go back to the full council. That um, was an identified issue, but it's not an OCA issue. Um, and um, there was the uh, final uh, question that um, is to whether we have in any way um, based upon our most recent experiences, changed our uh, view on what the criteria would be for who would be a resident member of the committee. Um, knowing that we have the time, we've gone beyond our time limit and that uh, Dorothy has to leave, I wanted to at least share that with you. I did um, explain to Oka yesterday that um, we were limited in time today because we knew we would be um, working hard on dealing with the percent for arts question. Uh, but I, so we may need to schedule another meeting, but I wanted to alert you to that. And um, I, uh, and, and get your feelings about when we can get back to the next meeting. Um, and, Evan was selected um, as the new chair. Congratulations. And um, I don't know if Evan is uh, the new chair of OCA or any of the other OCA members would like to add to what I just said. Well, I just, um, the time of day, we, we initially picked the time of day because of, uh, to accommodate some people among the five of us who couldn't work evening hours and also to make it easier for staff to be here without putting, so I don't think it's a fix, but clearly that's when we've been meeting. So the question I think that came up is some people withdrew because of that time of day, and 
if we're flexible, I think we should make that decision now because we're going to be reopening the interview process, I assume, you know, asking people who withdrew to say if we met a different time. And my understanding it was a daytime problem as opposed to if we met in the morning versus the afternoon. Um, late. So it would re reopen it and the interviews, interviews would have to happen with people who withdrew. Um, so we don't even know who would be in the queue. For the, so that seems like a, if, if we would be willing to do that, it seems like we should make that decision now because it's, it sets a whole nother thing in motion. Um, because I think there were qualified applicants who were willing to serve during the day. So it's not that we didn't have applicants for uh, these positions. Yeah. Um, I believe that is correct. And I want to make it clear that I did not ask the committee, and, the, um, and therefore the committee didn't have to answer the question as to who withdrew. Um, it was the, just based on the statement that there were qualified applicants who withdrew. I don't know who they were. Yes. Um, I, I know that my husband said that looking around he's, last night, he said, how much money is being spent on overtime for all of the town people at the meeting last night? And um, I've got to imagine it was quite a bit. I do think we want to stick to daytime meeting. We have found town workers, staff, extremely helpful to us in our work. And, um, you know, I did set my teaching schedule to be Tuesday, Thursday again, but, um, you know, 2.30 or 2.30 uh, 2 would be fine. I think there's a problem with adding another nighttime meeting. Every Monday we have to keep open for um, possible town council. And then there are all these other hearings and meetings that if we went to them, we would never ever be home for dinner. Um, just a couple pieces of information in response. Um, one is that uh, the former finance committee um, regularly met as an evening meeting, as do many town meetings, town boards and committees, um, planning board, zoning, board of appeals are all tend to be evening meetings. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that virtually all of the meetings that I, when I was uh, liaison on the select board were evening meetings. Um, staff um, who attend meetings, um, it's not, um, they're usually, it's not an overtime, it's a uh, compensatory time. So they do, uh, it, it does affect their work hours, but it's not an overtime issue. And uh, so, yes, Shalini, and then I'll, I see mm -hmm. Alyssa's hand up. Most of my classes are in the evening, and I norm <clears throat> normally just teach twice a week, but it just limits my opportunities to teach in the evening if we have another evening meeting. Because we already have Monday, and then we have some other meetings, and then um, our district me Oh, yeah, we have district meetings in the evening, so two days are already out for me out of the four, and then if we have this, this will be the third meeting, and then I can't... Uh, so um, let me pause just for a second. Uh, uh, Dorothy has had to leave, and she advised us that she has a class schedule that she had to attend. Alyssa, but please, please to use a microphone. We are actually being recorded by Amherst Media. I'm sorry. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for pointing out that the Finance Committee for decades has met at night with staff present, sometimes when they're needed and other times not. I think the other thing we're overlooking when we're saying that all, most of the council committee meetings, which is where much of the council committee work is being done, is being done during the day, which is awfully convenient for some of the councilors right now, but it's not particularly convenient for the public, and we're hearing that input on a regular basis because people with, there actually are people with nine to five jobs in Amherst and they can't ever watch it live. That doesn't mean that we don't have incredibly complicated schedules to work around. So one of the things that we tried to make clear yesterday at our OCA meeting was that we were not in fact expecting you to change your meeting time if this is what you had to do because it's what you had to do. Just like we would not if we had a super amazing planning board candidate come in and they said, yeah, but you know, I really can't ever do Wednesdays. We'd say, well, sorry, because that's when planning board meets. And so there are always going to be those push-pull things. What was unclear is whether or not 
the schedule might be changing at some point in the future or if there was if there was more flexibility available than had been expressed to people because they were given a handout prepared by the finance committee that said the meetings were at such and such time so they took themselves out of the mix just like you would if you were applying for planning board and you can and you taught on a Wednesday night so that's all we were trying to be clear on and there's no indication at this point that we're reopening interviews so that's not a discussion we've had yet and so if any input you have as to how we can explain this more thoroughly to candidates in the future, whether or not it impacts this particular pool, would be great. And the other question we had asked was, given the period of time that has lapsed, because we all knew that we had a lot of other priorities and things we absolutely had to get done under the charter, that we delayed appointing these non-voting residents, if there had been any change over this time period now that you've been through so much of the budget cycle as to what you were looking for in those candidates as opposed to what we all imagined was true back in February, if we need to do additional work on those candidates, but things are in flux right now. So, Lynn? Um, I personally would like us as a finance committee to go back and look at our charge I also understand at some point there was a discussion about terms and staggering versus what it said. So I, I really feel that we should go back and have a more full conversation about this before OCA continues with this uh, nomination. Okay, I just want to, you know, for the record, this wasn't a discussion we had last December or January. We talked about criteria and bringing non-voting people on in April. And we re came back and revised the charge to go from four to three when we decided a size. And we had a pretty long discussion, um, including whether we would be doing the interviewing or whether OCA would be doing the interviewing and listed the kinds of people, backgrounds, including a, a experience outside Amherst, not just inside Amherst. So we did, we didn't have a short discussion and it wasn't in the ancient past. It was having worked together for five months um, and thinking what could do enrichment. So the notion that we're gonna go back to everything um, to me would be that we somehow didn't get a good mix of people applying for this and we're um, short. Um, so if that's what's driving this, I, I, I'd like to understand. I don't mind having another conversation about it. I'm just saying that we had, we spent time in the rules committee, then we spent time in the finance committee, then we spent time in the council. So this was not a, you know, so I just want to understand what the origin is um, on reopening Lynn, the overall charge, because on staggering, I was the one who talked about three-year terms, staggering, you know, bringing them on a different, and uh, the larger group didn't want to do that. Um, so we went to two-year terms, you know, so I'm, I know where, what, why I was thinking of continuity past the time that we were on. So the reopening seems to be coming from OCA rather than we considered, but um, in other words, yeah. So, so I can hopefully feel some of this. Um, so where, where this is coming from. So OCA had um, uh, chosen a designee um, about a month ago. That designee has performed the interviews and put forth some recommended appointees. We began discussion of them at our OCA meeting yesterday. Um, one of the things that we were looking at then is um, how we're, there was a discussion in OCA about how we're evaluating these designees. The intention we've always seen was that uh, the whole point, and not these designees, these recommended appointees, um, the understanding was that the, the intent of the Charter Commission had been to appoint uh, non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee uh, to bring expertise to the Finance Committee should elected councilors not have that expertise. The thought was now that the Finance Committee has already gone through a budget cycle and has gained some expertise in this, is that still what Finance Committee feels they need? The alternative perspective that was put forth by one member of OCA was that perhaps the role of these non-voting uh, resident members 
um, would be to bring perspectives or ask new questions, which would be a very different role than the one put out. And so I think uh, this was not having to do with any um, paucity in the pool. Uh, we had actually a fairly rich pool of candidates, as you've seen, uh, since all the counselors have the CAS. Um, it was just having now gone through a full budget cycle um, as, as a finance committee, do you still feel as if what was put forward and, and the role of those non-voting resident members is to bring expertise as opposed to something else? Um, so that was sort of, that, that was the origin of that conversation. Uh, with regard to the, the timing thing, I don't think that OCA necessarily has any intention of <coughs> reopening uh, the interviews. Um, there's a lot, the OCA process has been discussed uh, ad nauseum, right, on the council. And so uh, we, are, we are well aware of some of the shortcomings, one of which is um, that with the exception of the OCA designee, us on OCA, um, aren't even aware uh, who withdrew based on the time or whether those, in, those withdrawals came prior to or during an interview. Some people, uh, I know in my experience in, in doing interviews for ranked choice voting, someone withdrew during the interview themselves. Um, and so we, do, we don't have that information. Uh, where this conversation came from, and I can speak for myself because I, as Andy can attest, was one of the main people um, making an issue out of this, was, uh, my, my memory, which is memory, and the minutes don't accurately capture this, was that when we met with some representatives of the Finance Committee back in uh, early May about this whole process, uh, I asked a question about whether or not an individual's ability to meet between 2 and 4 p.m. Um, was a minimum requirement. So are we disqualifying people? And my memory was, it's our strong preference, but if there's a really great candidate, um, what happened was anyone who couldn't meet during that time was not considered. Um, and so the question became, does finance committee intend to hold that meeting time going forward? Planning board's been in existence for a long time, right? So you, never, you wouldn't ask planning board to change their meeting time. Um, but if finance committee envisions that 2 to 4 p.m. is its meeting time for the next two years, right, which is the, the term that we're, that we're recommended, um, then that's important, that is a minimum qualification. But if there's any suggestion that finance committee might be altering those times, um, such as they did today, or perhaps if there's a, a, these appointments are one year, right? If there's a new finance committee, new members appointed in January by the president and the times change, well, all of a sudden we used a, a minimum requirement of the ability to meet that time um, for a time that in the end is flexible. And so the, the question we had for finance committee was, is that the time going forward for the next two years? Is 2 to 4 p.m., or is there some flexibility? And if there is some flexibility, you know, do you as the Finance Committee feel like we should have been disqualifying people based on that? Um, I know that you don't have time to fully talk about this today. Um, you're out of time. Uh, that said, um, as Chair Voca, I would like uh, some guidance from finance because we are scheduled to meet on Monday, July 1st, uh, for what will be our third meeting on the recommended uh, appointees as non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee. And so if there is a feeling among the Finance Committee that you do not want us to proceed until you've had this conversation, that will impact uh, the agenda that I've been writing in the back of the room today. Um, so I'd, I'd love a little bit of feedback on that. And I think that we're in an awkward position because the earliest we could find to schedule an additional meeting if we needed one and we that's our, going to be our last item would be actually at the same time that you're meeting. Or it should be uh, during July the daytime 1st. on the 1st. July 1st, have, Monday, July 1st? Yes. Um, I think that was the earliest we came up with as a possible date. We don't know that we're going to need to use it now because We've now um, completed our work on what was the most time-sensitive issue that we were dealing with. Um, back to the committee. Yes, Shalini. I, I personally, it's really difficult for me because I hate to make everyone change because of me, but I really have only four days. And I'm just doing, it's a very simple calculation. There are like two meetings that two days in the evening that are already committed to town council because of the district meeting and 
our Monday meetings, town council. So, and I need two days for teaching, teaching in the evening. So I don't know how other than I can quit the finance committee. <laughs> yeah, I think That's that the, the other question that was uh, being posed was um, not just that, but also morning meetings on a regular basis. Okay. Morning is fine. Yeah, morning is fine. And, you know, I'm the most flexible of all of us, but we literally mirrored the handout that was done on right. planning. So if the, if the question is daytime hours versus evening hours, I mean, certainly if there were people that would, could have met in the morning versus the afternoon, that's a different question. So, yes. I, I personally am fine if we move to an evening. I personally would prefer it be early or even a late afternoon. Um, I, like many other people, enjoy being home uh, occasionally. I enjoy being home anytime, but occasionally I get home. Uh, but I do, and I do want to make the role of the council feel like it's doable by anybody who feels they can run and serve. Um, so I just wanted to say that personally. Um, I'm just trying to figure out whether or not we're going to be able to give Evan and the committee a full set of responses, because it seems to me we have three questions on the table. Um, one is when we're meeting. Another is do we even want these people added to our committee? And the third one is the issue of terms. So I, that's more discussion than yeah. As far as the time of meeting, let me, I'll just make my own comment real quick on that. I mean, I think that I would be fine with morning meetings, and if that was, a, and I think that we probably do have the ability to make that shift if we recognize that there was valid reason to do so. My recollection, Dorothy unfortunately had to go, is that, she, that her general teaching schedule is two afternoons a week and uh, that we were working around the afternoons, that mornings was not an inhibitor for her. And I think that we were just, uh, so that there was no magic to the time of the, the day <laughs> that we chose. Uh, my other general comment is I think that the council hopefully was going to figure out how to have um, fewer meetings of committees because um, our schedule, is getting to the point where it's going to discourage a lot of people from being able to run for the council in the future. And if we really want to make the council available to the community at large, uh, then we have to make sure that it's a doable job. Uh, but I think that's a separate issue that's going to have to work its way out before the end of the third year. Uh, it's not one that we're going to solve for this particular purpose that the OCA needs to finish this process one way or another. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, I, would, I just want to say one more thing on yeah. the um, Evan is raising that now that we've become amazing experts, do we need the extra expertise? And I think my answer would be a solid yes. yes. Um, so I don't know what else you've heard, but you know, a, I don't think you can count on me. Um, I'll just talk about it. I, can't, I don't think you can always count on the richness of who you have on the current finance committee in terms of backgrounds and expertise. And the whole goal of this is to make um, the, as I see it, I think the charter was right. You can't count on that. So you don't know who will be on finance. We're only appointed for one-year terms. And to the extent the intense meeting has some people drop off and someone else say, I'm going to give it a try, we could have rotation coming through, our, which is very healthy. I think I would encourage counselors to go through the, you know, being staring at the budget so you can instantly say, how much do we spend every year? And how much does it, you know, I've got them memorized at this point. Um, but, but I think that's a, a healthy thing because we should need to know that. So this brings us a continuity. And I also think to the extent we get people who aren't 
just Amherst Council or Amherst Finance Committee, that they've had some experience beyond the town or beyond just a finance committee, it's a new set of eyes that asks questions. Um, I noticed counselors who weren't on finance, you being one of them, had very detailed questions on the budget um, because you hadn't had to sit through all the hours, but a group that's just focused on this I think is extremely healthy. So I would not reopen that question. If two years from now we find you know eight people is just too much or we can't find anyone who wants to be on finance, who's not a counselor, then I think we could revisit that we're not getting thoughtful, creative people willing to spend the time. But I think it's very healthy um, to do what the charter envisioned. They said may, but I think it's a good thing. Um, Thank you. That feedback is helpful. Yeah. I mean, the other thing in this is uh, a piece that I think that probably the council needs to talk about more broadly than just the committee is it gets back again to what the role of the committee is. Um, and uh, the former finance committee had a very different role because the budget was being presented by the finance committee to the town meeting. Now the budget is presented by the town manager to the town meeting and we are just pro providing advice. So um, it is a little bit of a different role in how that factors out. I'm not gonna get into because I could get into a 15 minute philosophical discussion, but uh, we are, um, in a new territory, and I think that, you know, when I suggested that I would want to have conversations with uh, people who are being proposed, not to screen them out, but just to make sure that they're comfortable with the fit is that I think the Finance Committee, somebody who served on the Finance Committee actually has to understand the difference in the process. Uh, that's what I was really getting at yesterday. Uh, and. Uh, but unless, um, so what I think that we're at is, is that there would be a willingness to consider a time of day change. There's not a willingness right now um, or an ability to change to evening meetings. Uh, and at this point, we may be too late in the process to suggest that going back to people would be a change, uh, be an appropriate thing to do. And by mean that going back to candidates who withdrew because of the time of day issue. So Especially, you know, if you found out that it was daytime was the problem, you know, that it doesn't matter whether it's 10 o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon, that was the challenge, right. uh, you know, so I, 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 and since I have no idea, <laughs> yeah, somebody knows. So. I'm, I'm confused though at what are the terms that people are being appointed for? Two years, I think. It was. Uh, OCA's vote as of yesterday was a maximum of two years. There had been no conversation yet of staggering and we had not assigned terms to any individuals. Uh, of course, this is OCA's recommendation. And. What does our charge say, Kathy? The finance committee charges two years. Two years, right, okay. And, and it was because I lost the argument on staggering and I lost the argument no longer, yeah. One of the possibilities for us to consider is that you proceed and we try it out and after the two year term is up, before our terms are up, we make a recommendation back to the council whether we think this should be continued or not. That's an option. I'm not making a motion. And we probably left it open that in theory, some could be one year and some could be two year. We, we said, you know, it, it, I was told that we didn't have to put staggering into the charge the way we did it, but we could make that decision. Right. They're just not, Three years is no longer a possibility because we went to two was, I mean, we could go back to the record. Mandy was saying, well, maybe you could even do, I didn't understand 
how we could do three if we said two, but in any case. Um. So are we in a position to take formal action here? Uh, because we really are just providing guidance at this point, and that may be the best we can do right now. And this guidance has been very useful for, for us to take back to OCA. But I think one of the guidance you're hearing is to the extent it was the afternoon hours versus morning hours that right. was a problem. If someone withdrew just on the basis of that, um, and you're willing to do one or two more interviews. I, I mean, I don't know whether we're talking we lost one person, or we lost three people, or you know what happened. Um, that that would be it um, in terms of we we already expressed you know a diversity of experiences coming on um, and laid out in verbally and also in writing what the kinds of uh, experiences and or expertise or thought processes that would be useful. Thank you. So. Um, anything else to add on that? I don't think so. You have sufficient. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think we have what we need. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, percent for arts discussion we obviously did not get to today, and I'm not even going to start down that path. Um, yeah, but we will need to, as the next step, identify the issues that we need to consider. We do have a little bit more time there because I think the council vote was that we they wanted us to report back in 45 days. So uh, we still have time to work on that. Um, and uh, the other question that was up there um, was um, the decision making process for the large building projects. Those two items need to be put off for our next meeting. We could. Um, schedule a meeting earlier than we had originally planned for our next meeting, but I think those are the two items. Um, I don't think there, there are there any budget updates, Sonia. Yeah. Since you're still, so there are no budget updates. Um, I don't in public comment. I don't know if there's additional public comment, but uh, really it was did public comment previously on the major item of the day. So I think that our major task left is just, um, quite frankly, scheduling the next meeting so that we can adjourn. Um, and um, I'm trying to look back and uh, make sure that I have the date of the next Finance Committee meeting as of right now. July 23rd. I think, yeah, that's what I had, July 23rd also. Do we know that Sean can be available that day since we're Yes, Sean, is, um, I believe, was prepared to be available that day. Okay. And uh, when I emailed him and told him uh, it was not worth his spending time, he was welcome to be here, but we didn't need him here. He said he'd use the time to work on refining the analytical tool, okay. uh, which I said was fine. Uh, so, um, can we postpone all these items till the 23rd and knowing that that puts pressure, or do we want to schedule an earlier meeting in order to get percent for arts going? Just looking at my calendar, if you wanted earlier, I could do the 9th. I cannot do the 16th. I'm on a river. Hmm. My river, yeah. You know, so I, you know, it's a question, I guess we don't have to, if we move forward with the, the non, resident appointments by that time, they would be joining us for the first time on the 23rd, correct? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. Um, the, actually, they have to go forward to the town council. That means they have yeah. to go forward on July 1st. Right. And our next meeting of the council is not till the 22nd, so it's really whether or not they'd come forward on the 22nd and be available on the 23rd. Right, so um, it, that's what I mean. They might be, yeah. but it's not. For sure. Yeah. Right. I, I'm not available on July 9th. Okay. So if, um, let's leave it for the 23rd as the next meeting. It's fine and, with me. uh, So I think that at that point, uh, we have the plan that I will start working on the report with Kathy and uh, for uh, the topic of the 
topic of the day. And uh, I think there were otherwise uh, somebody wanted to move to Okay, adjourn. and can I just check um, on my calendar on the 23rd, it's back to the 2 o'clock slot? That's um, what I have on my schedule. That's what I have in mind, so I, that's what I'm holding, so I, I'm, I can do morning also. That's what I have. Okay. I, yep. Okay. It's two o'clock. So, <laughs> is there anything else, or does somebody want to make a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. And all in favor? Yes. Aye. So, four to zero. One member now absent. Thank you very much, Amherst Media. We appreciate your uh, recording this meeting. I think it was an important one to make available to the public. And um, thank you, uh, Anthony, very much for your help. And uh, thank you, Sonia.